time for another edition of AEW Unrestricted, the official podcast of All Elite Wrestling. Before we get moving here, I want to remind you that AEW Casino Game is now available to download. Isn't that right, Aubrey? That's right. AEW Casino Double or Nothing is now available on the App Store for iOS and Android. You can download it, play tons of different casino games all in a singular app. Be sure to catch me at the poker table where I will take all of your money and then give it right back to you because I'm terrible. Uh, definitely download it today. It's super fun. Very cool. We're very happy to have with us uh, truly one of the most exciting signings that we've had in AEW and, and since we've been around for almost two years. Uh, Christian Cage is with us. And what an excitement to have him uh, with us and have him on our podcast. Christian, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. I appreciate you having me. And uh, yeah, Tony, you were a, a guest on mine and Edge's podcast a while That's ago. Right. So it's it's cool to be able to, to return the favor in a, in a, in a way here and, and jump on and talk to you guys. Thank you. I had a great time on your podcast. I remember yeah. that very, very well. And uh, it made me go back and watch, uh, watch you guys in action again over the network a few times. I said, let me check those out once again. And yeah, and, and I, and I actually, I went back and I, the first one I checked out was the, uh, the match with the Hardys, a ladder match. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. That was, uh, that was sensational stuff, man. Yeah. Jeez. That was the one, that was the one that, that, uh, that, that put us on the map for sure. Right. Um, took, took us to another level. And, um, uh, actually, Matt Hardy put it best. He said uh, that match took us from being WWE wrestlers to WWE superstars. Yeah, uh, overnight. So it was uh, that was definitely the um, the turning point for all of us. And if it wasn't for that match, who knows where we were? All four of us would have ended up at at, at this point. Yeah, you know, a, a lot of uh, a lot of fans say when they talk about ladder matches in the past and some mm -hmm. of the great historic ladder matches, they talk about Shawn Michaels and Razor Ramon. Right. But th the ladder match you guys had was the best one I'd ever seen. I mean, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And that was obviously yeah. the, the kind of the, uh, I can't say templates. It was a singles ladder match compared to a tag ladder match, but that's kind of right. where the idea, idea spawned. How do right. we take this idea of this match that we all kind of held in such high regard? How do we take that match and put a different spin on it and make it unique? And it was to put it in a tag situation. And right. that's what we did. And I felt like we kind of even raised the bar higher and continued to do so for years after that. Okay, so you get, you uh, went from uh, WWE superstardom, like uh, Matt Hardy said, to yeah. signing with AEW, right? Uh, and you signed during our pay per view. Uh, talk about the, that day for you and signing with with AEW because it was a very well kept secret. It really was. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, you walk out, and the fans really had a great reaction to it. Yeah, it was cool, and it was one of those things too where. Um, you know, it's, it's no secret. People saw me return a few weeks previous at the Royal Rumble and, and right. maybe assumed that, that that's where, where I was going to end up. And, um, you know, John Moxley is, is a really good friend of mine and he and I were, were talking a lot over the course of, of me attempting to come back and things like that. And, um, he, he you know, he kind of put that bug in my, he was telling me all about his positive experiences in AEW and what he felt. I could bring to the table there and he just laid it out he said look man he said you're you're a free agent you'd be doing yourself a huge disservice if you don't at least have a conversation with tony and right. he was right and um i did owe that to, to myself and and to my career to do that and i had a two-hour conversation with tony um i told john I said yeah go ahead and tell him if he if he wants to talk i would love to have a conversation with him 30 minutes later i got a text from tony who i'd met probably seven years previous i I'd, I'd met tony um with him uh, through a mutual friend and we had dinner and we hung out for a few hours. And I mean, it just blew my mind back then when the encyclopedia, he was of wrestling knowledge. And he was telling me about things about my career that I didn't remember myself, you know, and he does um, that. I know. <laughs> yeah. And, and so he was, you know, he was talking about my career. I was trying to convince him to let me be the general manager of the Jacksonville Jaguars with absolutely no, never played it down a football in my life, but I was just trying to convince him. Yeah. thought it'd be kind of a, a cool thing. It did happen. Uh, but uh, I don't sorry, know, man. So, they need a new quarterback. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so we, we we ended up talking on the phone for about two hours, and and more than anything, I, I genuinely liked. I, I liked him when I met him before, but having that conversation with him, just hearing the passion that he had as far as what he thought I could bring to the table, how I could help the show, how this is the right platform for me at this stage in my career, and then obviously me telling him the things that I wanted to accomplish and the things that I wanted to do, what I could bring to the table, it just worked. And more than anything, I just genuinely liked him as a person. And that goes He's a, a long good way. Guy. He's a good person. And, and um, I, I, that goes a long way with me. And I was pretty much sold after that conversation with him. And we had a couple more in the couple of days that, that followed it. And um, by the weekend, we we had agreed to a deal. And 
but it was funny and full disclosure when, when he made the announcement, when he had big show, make the announcement on that Wednesday that there was going to be a signing. Um, I hadn't signed yet. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was, it was the truth. I hadn't signed yet. So it oh. was, uh, um, it, but you know, I guess he felt pretty confident in the, in the uh, conversations that we had that, uh, that we were going to work together. I felt, I felt the same way. So it's, it, it's not lost on all of us. Like your first match back being Frankie was, Kazarian, the the history that you guys had. Did you right. have any input on that? Like, how did that sort of booking come to be? Yeah. Uh, before I get to that, I, I should also go back and actually answer the question that Tony asked me too. How oh I yeah, that? I guess. How whatever. did I feel that night? Fuck it that was, guy. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> it was it was it was surreal. You know, it was it was a surreal like because I was still at my house, and then you know on the Sunday, you know I was like, okay, you know I'll, I'll get there probably when the show has started. So you know kind of mid afternoon, I'm still hanging around my house and doing things I'd normally do. And next thing you know, I'm in a car and I'm driving and it's just, you know, and uh, I get there straight onto a bus and you know, it's, it's, it's nerve wracking, you know, cause you're like, God, does anybody, will anybody even care that I'm here? You know, you have those kind of thoughts that kind of go, sure. go through your head a little bit. And, um, you know, it was funny that I never put that, that this into perspective, you know, but I was, uh, Cody came on the bus to talk to me briefly and he said to me, he said, that, he said, and this made me feel great. He said, it's a big deal that you're here. And I was like, yeah. And he said, yeah, put this in perspective. For, for guys like you and I, it was Hogan. It was Andre. It was Macho Man. It was all of, uh, you know, Ted DiBiase. It was all these these superstars. He said, the majority of, of, of the talent in that locker room, that is what you are to them right. that same way. And I was like, whoa, I didn't really think about it like that. Yeah. And uh, so that just kind of put me in a whole different headspace as far as, you know, you know, going out there and it gave me some confidence. Not that I didn't, I was lacking confidence, but I was like, okay, yeah, cool. I made the right decision here. And, um, it, it was neat to walk through that common area and see all the faces and, uh, kind of light up when I walked through, that was a very cool moment and, uh, really meant a lot to me. And I was nervous, you know, I was nervous walking out through that curtain. Um, well, it just means you care. Yeah, of course. And, and so when I got out there and, you know, came back and kind of met everybody after that. I was put at ease right away. It's just, it's a great environment, a great place to be. And uh, to me, the thing I, I picked up on most from talking to um, most of the talent is the, the thirst for knowledge, how much everybody wants to get better. And that, that impresses yeah. me so much about the locker room. It's, uh, it's actually really incredible. And I totally agree with Cody in this case, because I actually started wrestling, uh, watching wrestling right around the time that like Edge retired the first time. So watching a lot of your matches, I think I told you this at work last week. Yeah. Like my you're you're my husband's favorite wrestler. Uh, that's awesome. So I appreciate it. He was he was very, very like, Oh my god, oh my god, you work with this guy. <laughs> like, is he cool? That's is cool. he cool? I'm like, Of course he's cool. We don't hire nah, people who a, aren't cool. He's a dude. jerk. He's a jerk. He's a dick. <laughs> yeah. Total dick. <laughs> Total. But yeah, no, like Cody's absolutely right. Like the the impression you've had on a lot of us, because we're, you know, a lot of us are really new to this business. Like you're, you're our guy. Like it's, it's so <laughs> great to it. have you around. So thanks. Thanks that you want to do the work ahead of time. Cause we all need the help. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like I said, it's, it goes, it, it reinvigorates me as well to, to, to know that I made the right choice as far as even coming back to, to the ring, you know? And uh, I feel like there was a, the way that my career ended seven years previous never really sat well with me. And, you know, you'd like to have a say in when it's time to go. And I didn't have that. It was, it was, I was told that and it, it never, I accepted it, but it didn't sit well with me. And then when I, I kind of started to put the work in and, and did all the testing and all those sorts of things to, to get the clearance to come back, um, man, it just, it just, it lit something under me and I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this and I'm going to close this chapter on my own, whatever that is, whether it's, whether it's one match, I come back and get to say I did it on my own terms or whether I come back for three years or five years or whatever it is, I'm going to do this on my own terms. And it just, uh, that was pretty exciting. All right. Let's talk about the Gazarian match, uh, at Aubrey to ask about and, yeah. uh, how did that come about? Yeah. So, um, I, uh, I had a conversation with Tony again, um, on the weekend before that, that, uh, that match. And I called him and I said, Hey, um, this outwork everyone shirt is pretty cool, but I better start working here pretty soon or it's not, it's not going to be that cool anymore. <laughs> so, right. uh, so he agreed. And, and, um, you know, uh, the first person that he, that, the, that he had said was Frankie and, and that was obviously he was 
at the, t- at the top of my list as well. Right. And a couple other people that I trust very much had said, hey, what about, that was all unanimous across the board. His name was first. And I think that says a lot about the talent of Frankie Kazarian. And mm-hmm. um, also the trust level of putting him in there with a guy that hasn't been in the ring in seven years. Like I know what I'm capable of, but still the fact is I haven't wrestled a match in seven years or hadn't at that point. So um, yeah, it was in like, I go along back a long way with Frankie. He's a close dear friend of mine. And um, it also, I wanted to do just as much for him as he wanted to do for me. And um Man, I just I wanted to, to raise his stock no matter what happened in that match, and um, and I know he felt the same way about me. And when you have two guys committed to that purpose, I think you're going to go out there and do something really special. Right, right. And, and you did. What type of feedback did you get backstage afterwards? Uh great. I mean, it was it was kind of surreal. You know, like it was kind of a blur the whole thing. To mm-hmm. be honest with you, it, okay. it it's it's. But when I came back, you know, when you have your peers standing there at the curtain waiting for you and patting you on right. the back. And telling right. you it looks like you never missed a step and man you never lost it and that was unbelievable to watch i mean that's that's humbling stuff you sure. know and it's like i thought i was never gonna be able to do this again and to come back and do it at, at a high level and um wanted to do it at the highest level and not only come back and be what i once was i'm coming back to be better than i ever was and that was the first step so that to, to, to have people tell me those those things Man, it just it, it just it motivated me even more than I was. If that's even possible, sure. I mean, that so itself would, is also motivating. Just with all, I mean, we keep saying like, there's all these young talent. Like now, you come out, you have this banger of a match, and even Kazarian is just like, oh my god, that was incredible. One of the best matches I've had. The dude's so good, and everyone's just like, oh, we got to step it up. Okay, cool. It's it's great. Like it's it's literally living by the motto of your shirt. It's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, and I have to, you know, and I, you know, it's it's almost like light the fire under my feet first. You know, like I said, you can't come out with a shirt like that and just come out and give them the greatest hits and, um, you know, head to the back after four or five minutes, you know, it's, it's not, it's not going to fly. You have to go out there and you have to put in the effort and work and have that time. And that's the thing too. I love about AEW. There's so much time in these matches to tell these stories, to, 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 to build to something great and, um, uh, do it the right way. And that's what excites me more than anything. I'm I'm much better at 25, 30 minutes than I am at five minutes. I can't do it. You know, it's, that's, that's the hardest thing for me is like five minutes. What? I, I can't do that right. in five minutes. Yeah. I need, much, I need time. I need time. Much easier to call a match, put across a story in <clears throat> right. 15 minutes than it is in five minutes to try yeah. to get the point across. So right. I get it on your end. Uh, you out of the ring for seven years, mm-hmm. you know, you, you wanted to come back. You want to make sure you were healthy when you came back. How about training and nutrition leading back to coming back in the ring? Did yeah. you have to do any changes? What, anything? Oh man, I made lot, uh, some big life changes, Tony. I, yeah. I really did. So like, so I was, uh, <laughs> you know, it was, it's been, 2020 was a tough year for everyone, right? The pandemic sure. and all those sorts of things. And you know, you're, you're locked down and you know, gyms are closed and there's all kinds of reasons to make excuses to, to do, uh, to make poor choices as far as eating and, and, and those kinds of things. So um, I was happily living a retired life. You know, and I, I kind of say, well, it's better than half a box of cheeses in the evening sitting on the couch, a whole box of cheeses, you know, and that's kind of what I was <laughs> doing, you know? So it was Bro. like, <laughs> I was, I was not shy about walking past the pantry and grabbing a bunch of a handful of, of snacks or whatever. And, right. and, 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 but you know, and, and like I said, I was kind of doing some half ass workouts in my garage with resistance bands and stuff like that, maybe going on for a run or a walk or something like that. And then when I decided that, um, you know, it was the unsanctioned match on raw that, that made me realize that I really wasn't okay with how it ended. And that was because I was on a non-contact list and I couldn't be touched and all these other sorts of things. And I was like, really, I'm that fragile. Like I feel great. It's like that, that I can't even be touched. Like, so I decided to go on my own uh, to the university of South Florida here and um, saw some, some doctors and I went through all the testing and I sat down with the doctor afterwards and he said, to me uh what is it you're looking to do he said because your test scores were great they were average or above average on everything you weren't below average on on any of these test scores your physical tests were great we we walked through everything kind of step by step and then he said to me what do you want to do and i said i'd like to end my career on my own terms i'd like to get back in there and go but if you're telling me that that there's a chance that opens up doors for me and if you're telling me that there's not 
then I'm in no different position than when I woke up this morning. It doesn't change anything as of right now. But, and he's like, I don't think you're crazy at all. He said, I think you can do this. Wow. And I was like, wow. So, so, yeah. So it just, it went from there. And then I went to another specialist up in Pittsburgh and I went through like a five hour, like really um, thorough uh, con- 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 uh, concussion testing where I, I saw three or four different specialists and I, I did a full like 45 minute workout in the gym. Just all these, it was really, really uh, put me through the, the paces and uh, the doctor said the exact same thing. And so that was like, wow, um, now I gotta, now I gotta, now the work starts. It really starts because I didn't want to be like, you know, come to a future employer and say, Hey, I got cleared. If you give me a job, I'll get ready. You can't do that. That's unprofessional. You have to do the work, then go to your potential employer and say, Hey, this is what you're going to get. And uh, so that was the mindset that I, that I had from that second on, I came home, um, I hired a nutrition company out of Tampa called Nutrition Solutions who completely dialed in my uh, my meals and the, w- the way that I even thought about eating. Um, so uh, I-, I stuck to that and did that religiously. And I built, uh, I went to the gym like one time <laughs> during the pandemic, like just when they started to open the gyms back up and I went with a mask and I was so paranoid about people getting close to me and I said, like, oh, you know, like I just, I couldn't concentrate and I felt like I was just rushing to get out of the gym rather than going in and focusing on having a good workout. I just, I couldn't, right. I couldn't deal with that. So I built a small gym in my garage and honestly it was the best thing I ever did. Cause I could just go out there alone in solitude, put some music on and in Florida, middle of the summer, hundred degree plus heat in that garage. And it was just mm-hmm. like, it was a real challenge to myself. Like, can I outlast this heat and get this workout in? And that's what I would just would push myself and push myself and push myself no matter how hard it was. And I just kept grinding and I just kept pushing. And then like, I started to see positive results just because I was sticking with it, being consistent and consistency is the key when it comes to, to nutrition and to working out. And, um, that's what I did. I was just consistent and I stuck to it. And every day I walked out there in that garage and I put the work in. And uh, I just saw my body starting to change and I saw my mindset starting to change and I knew, I knew this was going to happen. I really did. So before we go to break, I have one very important question. Was there a particular kind of cheese it that you had in the pantry? Oh, uh, just, oh, so extra toasty is my go-to. Good, good <laughs> yeah. selection. Yeah. I like it. We're talking yeah. with uh, Christian Cage here on AEW Unrestricted, Tony and Aubrey. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about you coming to AEW, but pretty soon we're <laughs> going to talk about a lot of those memorable moments back in the day. This is AEW Unrestricted. Aubrey and Tony here with Christian Cage, the one and only. So you have had a history, and we, we chatted about this a little bit in the first segment, uh, you know, glorious tag team run. Uh, now you're here, AEW, as a singles competitor. I mean, initially, maybe. Who knows what happens? Wrestling's always willing to change. But what are your thoughts on AEW being so focused on building an awesome tag team uh, division? I think it's great. Um, you know, obviously, tag team wrestling holds a near and dear um, spot in my heart. You know, it's it's what put myself on the map and, and took me to... And it also gave me a, a comfort level as far as... Um, you know, I was a pretty shy kid growing up and even when I got into, to wrestling, I was still very shy. I didn't have a lot of experience speaking in front of people or cutting promos. And that was kind of one of the things too, that I've always kind of done in my life, things that scare me instead of shying away from them. I always kind of go after the things that scare me. And so like public speaking terrified me. So I would force myself to get up in front of people and talk, even though like I was a nervous wreck, my palms would be sweaty. And I felt like I would, like my mouth was dry, all these things. But um, going into a tag team with my best friend, there was a comfort level there. I could turn to him and I could talk to him like I was just talking to my friend instead of having to worry that I was talking to thousands of people. And that gave me a comfort level. And once I got that comfort level, like I can do this, it started giving me confidence. Then when you start getting confidence, it's it's automatic. You're not really thinking about that anymore. It's not in the back. It's not in the forefront of your mind. It just it's something that you do. And um, so that tag team, you know, gave me that, gave me the ability to, to develop a character with, with my partner and having that comfort level. So there's always a comfort back and forth there, I think with a partner as well. And listen, when, when tag team wrestling is done, right. It's the best match on the show every single time. That's 100%. Right. It, it, it's, it, you know, it, so when you have a lot of exciting and great tag teams, like they are in AEW, I think, 
I think it's amazing. And it gives options too. You know, you can put, you know, uh, two wrestlers together and make a tag team where you can split two apart. Uh, I mean, it's, I, I think that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a backbone of, of any company in my opinion. And it, it should be that way. And it would really bum me out for, for years when there was a real lull in tag team wrestling. So I'm glad it's had a resurgence, a, re, uh, a resurgence. I really am. And, and kind of follow up to that. And also to kind of build on what we talked about in the first segment, when you arrived and how much important you are to this uh, young mm-hmm. talent base that we have, uh, how big of a star you are to them, sting you, Paul white, Uh, Do you feel, and I think you should feel like you could offer them advice because they will listen and talk to them about tag team wrestling, what you remember and help coach them along. Have you thought about doing some of that? Of course. Yeah. And that was one of the things that I stressed to Tony when we talked as well. And I I said that to him, I said, look, I'm not just uh, here for the ride. You know, I'm here for, I'm all in on this, you know, and it's a no pun intended, but I mean, it's uh, um, if I'm part of the team, I'm part of the team. And I, I, I said to him, I was like, I know I have a, I don't know everything, but I know a lot. And a lot of times when you get those different perspectives, you can give somebody a, a different perspective that they might not have thought about before. And so I told him, I was like, yeah, I'm really interested in, in um, helping doing some coaching and, and all those sorts of things as well. I'm here for, for, for everyone if they need me. So uh, uh, definitely that, I, I, that excites me a lot to be able to pass that knowledge uh, along. We chatted a little bit about your, your famous TLC match with uh, the Hardy brothers and kind of the, the evolving of that match format with it being uh, Shawn Michaels and Razor Ramon. Uh, what was your approach back then when you were building on something that was already so iconic into something that is today? Cause I think it really set the tone for not only just tag team chemistry, but ladder matches itself. Yeah. You mean as far as tag team ladder matches go or as far as like ladder yeah, matches yeah. as a whole? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the first one, I think we tried to learn from all of them, right? Instead of um, just kind of having, you got to take that car crash element out of it at some point where you're doing things just for the sake of doing them, just for the sake of doing something big or falling off something big. There has to be a purpose and a reason for all these things. So trying to put, you know, psychology, as you say, into these, you know, the, the, the end goal is to get whatever's hanging above the ring whether it's a briefcase, whether it's a title belt, whatever it is. So that should always be the focus and the goal is try to get those. You know what I mean? And um, I think as far as that is always the goal. So whenever there's a chance to go up, you're going with that purpose. To me, you're doing the right thing. So trying to to, to add those elements in of, 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 the, of what you're doing, why you're doing it, and then the big things will mean more too when you do them. And so it was, it was just trying to figure out the, the right ways to, to, to do these kind of car crash type situations. And I think we, as we went along, I think we got better doing that. Let's talk about your debut in uh, WWE 1998. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Uh, yep. Your debut match, you won the light heavyweight title. Yeah. And uh, were you kind of, were you surprised the way that you got the title in your debut match? Not many people do that. I know. Yeah. It was, uh, it was another kind of big moment for me. And uh, it was, I was, I was doing these, these training camps, um, at the head office in Stanford, Connecticut, and we were doing these little spot shows for killer Kowalski, uh, right towards the end of the camps. Like we do these week long camps. And, um, I remember getting a tap on the shoulder and saying, Hey, uh, it was like on a Thursday or Friday, you're starting at the pay-per-view on Sunday. And that was the, all the information that I got. And then later was told that I was going to be coming in with Gangrel as part of the brood. And it, it was just a whirlwind, you know, I'm, right. you know, and then I actually had a, uh, a show that I was, that I was doing for a small company called ECWA in Delaware on the, on the set. Was it on, yeah. It was on the, it was on the Friday. Sorry. Was it Friday or Saturday? I, I was one of those nights Okay. and this promoter treated me really well and I didn't want to cancel on him last minute. So I ended up making that show. I did that show, went on early and jumped on a plane and flew uh, to Toronto and then drove to Hamilton where the, where the pay-per-view was. So the night before I was wrestling in front of 200 people in a small hall in Delaware. And then I walked out the next night in front of, you know, 16,000 people on a pay-per-view and it was a pretty surreal moment. It was like, yeah, yeah it was, uh, it was, it was unbelievable. Like to, to just, it was like a dream. And then I remember I kind of, I, I packed up my stuff when I left the arena that night. And I kind of walked through the crowd and stood at ringside and um, during Edge's match against Owen Hart and I caused Edge to lose. And then I jumped over and I, and I walked away. But I remember leaving the building. 
people kind of started surrounding. I was just like, oh, I'll just walk out like I normally do. But people kind of surrounded me. You're the guy that walked out. You're the guy that walked out. And I was like, oh, man, my life is never going to be the same from this moment on. <laughs> nope. It's changed. Right. It's done. It's, it's changed, you know? So yeah. that was a pretty big moment. But yeah, to, to then a few weeks later have that opportunity to wrestle Taka Michinoku for the light heavyweight championship was, um, was also, man, you can't ask for a better debut than that. You know, right. it really was, it was a, it was a special night. So you have that, you have all of the other amazing moments you had. And then in 2005, I think it was you left and, uh, went to your TNA run. Right. So a lot of also really exciting moments there. I think in 2006 was the six sides of steel barbed wire match with Rhino. <laughs> oh yeah. Lots of Gosh. blood weapons. Yeah. I mean, like you're already a big fan of TLC and now let's, let's, let's just turn up the notch a little bit. Jeez, uh, dude. <laughs> I know. Any anytime you get a chance to beat up Rhino, uh, you, you can't pass that up. So <laughs> fair, I, fair. I, I, had, I had to take that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, yeah, that was, uh, there was some, some innovative uh, matches as well there. And uh, I really enjoyed my three years in TNA. People always ask me about it and I have nothing but great things to say about them. Dixie Carter, Jeff Jarrett, they both treated me really, really well when I was there. And they more than anything, they gave me a platform. I felt like I could work on top of the card and wrestle on top of the card. And they were, gave me every opportunity to do so and um, gave me the confidence that I needed going forward in my career. So I'll always uh, be thankful to, to both of them for that. So you had a lot of great matches in TNA, uh, the match against Jeff Jarrett for the NWA title, the latter match against Kazarian. Mm -hmm. You had that uh, 2007 match against Samoa Joe. Yep. Um, oh. Some of the, give us some of the the, uh, the highlights. I mean, you, you already mentioned it was a great run for you, but uh, yeah, any of those matches the, stand the, out? Yeah, obviously the highlight would be winning the uh, the NWA World Championship. Um, right. You know, the, the lineage of that title, I think, speaks for itself. So having a chance to hold that title uh, really meant a lot to me. Uh, being a fan uh, of the history of the wrestling business and um, holding it in such high regard. It really was uh, really, that was, that was a huge moment for me to be able to hold that title. Um, but yeah, I remember getting there and it was same, same kind of thing. There's a such, such a lot of um, untapped potential um, as far as, you know, guys like AJ Styles, Frankie Kazarian, um, you know, um, uh, Daniels was there at the time. He had been, he's sure he, he was seasoned, but he was still, you know, kind of, um, I don't want to say under the radar, but he was kind of a hidden gem, so to speak, in my mind, that, that he was there, uh, you know, just so, so much untapped potential potential there, like uh, Samoa Joe. It was just, uh, it was a, and to see where all those guys ended up was a testament to, to what kind of um, um, talent they all had. But yeah, I just saw the, looked at the landscape and it's like, man, there's, there's a, it's like a blank canvas. There's so much I can do here that's that's fresh and it's never been done uh, so it was exciting time it was exciting time to be there we were uh talking to mikey ruckus a little bit recently about uh building music for you uh and mm -hmm. having something that kind of uh called back to your old theme at tna uh how much involvement did you have uh with building uh your track when i originally went to tna no when you came here Oh, uh, yeah. I, so I had the same thing. I had a couple conversations with Tony about it. And I was like, man, that that music was kind of synonymous with Christian Cage. I think we can kind of, you know, maybe can we update it and make it our own, you know? And, you know, uh, also you want something that's going to be recognizable to people. And I feel like that music still was very much. Um, so, yeah, we kind of put a little spin on it and he agreed. And uh, he was, you know, he sent me a couple samples of it. And we just, uh, we, we all agreed that, that was the way to go. And it was, uh, it was pretty cool. We're talking with Kristen Cage uh, about his career and about his, what is a short, but hopefully a long time here in AEW. Next, we Please. have questions from the fans. Aw, uh, yeah. AEW Unrestricted, Aubrey and Tony here with the amazing Christian Cage. It's now time for fan questions where Tony and I stumble over pronouncing Twitter names uh, while also <laughs> learning amazing things about our phenomenal guests. Uh, first question is from Riot Krotz on Twitter. Uh, you recently appeared and helped produce the movie Cage Fighter Worlds Collide. What was your experience like being part of a movie? It was great. It was a lot of fun doing that movie. I'd never been uh, on that side of the camera before as far as um, producing. And um, so I had done a small independent film in Canada man probably five six years ago at this point in time but i was still uh friendly with the producers there and um the producer of this movie a guy named uh 
Shane Putzlocker. Uh, he knew that producer and had this, and he, he showed it to the, to the, they were, they were talking about the, the project and he said, Hey, you got to talk to my friend, Jay. He'll know, he'll be able to help you with the wrestling part of this script. And he's like your friend, Jay. And he told him who I was. And he's like, Oh man, I, I'm a huge fan. Yeah. I'd love to talk to him. So it just so happened that he was in Tampa and I was flying into Tampa and he was leaving. So we met for like 10 minutes at the airport. He handed me the script and said, read this and let me know what you think. So I read it. I made some notes um, as far as the, the wrestling part of the, of the movie. And um, I sent it back to him and we had another phone call and he just said, Hey, would you want to come on as an uh, executive producer of this movie and help and help us with this? And I was like, yeah, why not? <laughs> I mean, it's a, nothing else looks pretty, looks pretty cool on a resume. So it was, it was right. cool to get that other side of it, to sit in those meetings, those, those creative meetings and, and um, all the different things and how, how things change and how they adapt and make things work. And uh, yeah, and it was also pretty cool that I had a huge hand in um, casting John Moxley for that movie as well. Right. Uh, I, w- I want to follow up with that. You were uh, recently on History Channel's Night Fight. Yeah, that was a couple years ago as well. And that was pretty cool. I'd never done any hosting like that before. So it was a good opportunity. And and, uh, it was one of those ones where I didn't even have to audition for it. They had watched um, some some tape of my promos and things like that. And they're like, yeah, this is the guy for it. And so I went there and it was a great experience. I had so much fun doing that. And uh, the nights that were doing that, like these guys beat the shit out of each other. Like it (laughs) was intense. I'm telling you, like it man i had so much respect for those guys like they go to a lot of festivals and, and they do tournaments like not just here in the u.s but internationally they go all over the world and do this for for no money and i want really wanted to represent these these guys while they were doing this because it reminded me so much of the love that you have for wrestling on an independent level where you're right. really doing it for no money you're just right. trying to you're doing it for the love of the game and right I saw that in all of their eyes that they just loved this and had a passion for it. So I wanted to represent them well, make sure their stories were told. I thought we did a good job of that. I thought it was a really fun show and I, I just had a great time doing it. Uh, here to shit post on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> who at AEW uh, do you see yourself tagging with if you were to form a tag team? Oh man, that's a, uh, that's a good question. Um, I have, actually haven't thought about tag team wrestling yet. Ooh. Aubrey, who do you think I should team with? Um, I mean, seeing you and Kazarian team up would be pretty dope. Uh, that would be I, pretty I, badass. Huh? Yeah, I thought be especially pretty. with both of your tag team histories, like yeah. being able to combine all of that knowledge together, working with the younger guys. Yeah. I don't know. I'll call. I, I know a guy. I'll Cu- go talk to him. Cu- <laughs> couple, 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 couple salty vets. We call us the salty vets. And Roy's complaining about everything. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> cranky Definitely Frankie. Kazarian. Yeah. Cranky Frankie. There we go. <laughs> Okay, Adam Southfield on Twitter wants to know, was Edge's return in 2020 motivation for you to get into the ring? And did Edge say anything to you when you two hugged at the 21 Royal Rumble? Uh, yeah, of course it was motivation for me. But our injuries were completely different. Um, but it was like, man, if he can do it, maybe. Maybe. And then it just... I, I never really had the itch until I watched him go out there. And... I got so kind of emotional about it because I'm a control freak. And when you go out there, you can control everything that happens. And I wanted right. him to do so well that I was, I was, I was nervous that, that I couldn't control the situation. So I actually had to walk away and kind of get my composure and come back. But it kind of did put those, those kind of um, plant those seeds in my brain that maybe, and that I put it to the side until about the summer, like I said, when that un- unsanctioned match came up and I was like, yeah, the, yeah, we, I got to, I got to figure this out and see if this is, a po- this is possible. Um, I need to close this on my own, own terms. So, but uh, when he hugged me at the rumble, um, we didn't say anything that wasn't even a, a planned hug or anything like that. We just kind of, <laughs> we, I did my thing and turned around. He was standing there with a huge smile on his face, made me smile and we embraced. And then we just kind of went about our business. So it was uh, one of those spontaneous things. It was pretty, uh, just a, a great moment. You can't write those moments. Right. You can't. Right. Those are always the best moments in wrestling. Uh, what else we got here? Uh, Morphin Scout on Twitter. Is there anyone that you regret not being able to work a match with before leaving WWE? Man, uh, yeah. I mean, there, there's so much, so many talented to, uh, so many, uh, I would say probably Kevin Owens. Um, I just, I really like the, the, 
the passion that he has. Um, I, I like the way that he delivers his, his promos. I think he's fearless when he, when he delivers his promos. I think that he's uh, a fearless competitor in the ring as well. Um, I just like his style. Um, Sami Zayn as well. I thought that uh, with it, especially with this character the way it is now, we could have done some pretty special things. So off the top of my head, I would say probably those two guys. All right, this one's got to be a plant, but I'm going to read it. <laughs> I read it anyway. <laughs> Pro Wrestling Addict on Twitter. A lot of you guys out there and girls. <laughs> Christian, uh, you're in a big match, a stacked card. You're on fire. Aubrey's a ref, and she messes up the count. What do you say to Aubrey afterwards when you bump into her backstage? I don't say anything because Aubrey doesn't mess up the count. Wow. Fun story. Uh, I yeah. actually <laughs> messed up the finish uh, of a match the first time I worked with Frankie Kazarian, and that's what got me at AEW. So yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> I have famously <laughs> fucked up the finish for a match. Okay. Uh, but I appreciate you putting me over despite us not having worked together yeah. yet. Okay. <laughs> Checks gotcha. in the mail, buddy. Very well gotcha. said. Yeah. Uh, the John Elite on Twitter. With AEW's working relationship with other promotions, would you be open to facing opponents from Impact, NWA, New Japan, any of that? Uh, yeah. I mean, right now I'm focused on on AEW, but like we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm not against uh, anything, but obviously my focus is is you know, I feel like and I and I said this to Tony after my match. I was very emotional after the after the match, and I went over and I had a private moment with him, and I said. Uh, I owe you so much. Um, you, he basically signed me sight unseen. You know, having a, having a moment in the Rumble and having is not like going in and wrestling a 20, 25, 30 minute match. It's not the same thing. And um, he took me, he, 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 he really, from the conversations that we had, he understood what, understood what I wanted to do. But the fact of the matter is, I hadn't proven anything yet. What I can do in the ring or still do. And he still took that chance. And I'll never forget that. So my loyalty is is to Tony Khan and to AEW. Whatever happens after that happens. Yeah. Very well said. That was the a actual plant question. Yeah. <laughs> AJ on Twitter wants to know, uh, and I know how I feel about this, and I know how other people, but uh, tell us about it. How do you feel about having creative freedom over doing your own promos at AEW? Yeah, it's good. And it's one of those things, too, where, you know, you you have to – be invested in every single thing that you're doing because right. nobody's going to hand you a piece of paper and say, say, say this word for word. You have to be in tune and in touch with what it is you're trying to convey. And it's up to you to go out there and connect with the audience. And if you don't do that, it's on you. Well said. Susie Carmichael on Twitter. Would you ever consider writing a book after your in wrestling, uh, in ring wrestling career is complete? I've been asked that before. And, um, <clears throat> I never really had much interest in it. And um, I don't know, I'll, I'll say TBD, you know, I, I still, still haven't decided whether it's something that I want to do or not, but uh, um, I don't know if it, it's out there or not, but John Moxley's writing a book. Does everybody, does anybody know this? I did not. Oh, but he, he doesn't really talk about anything. So I don't know, <laughs> we, we, we might have to cut this part out, but if we get the, okay, I'll ask Renee if it's okay. I say it, but I'm going to say it. That dude is a talent. He's writing it himself. No ghost wow. writer. Whoa. And he let me read a blurb of it. And I'm reading it. And I was like, I looked at him. He's like, what? You know, what? You know how the way he is, right? I was like, yeah. I was like, what do you, hey, what do you want? You what are you a want? fucking amazing writer. Like, <laughs> I could I could picture every single thing he was saying in there. Like, it was happening in front of me. I was like, like you have a gift for writing. Like, I was blown away. So, I, I don't know if I'd want to because I don't think it'd be as good as his. <laughs> So that was the problem. Like you were totally, totally ready to write a book and then you read his shit. Now you're like, nope, nope, can't top it, whatever. Or I'd hire him to write mine. Mm. Boom, there you go. Teamwork. Yeah. Yeah. Share on the profits. I like it. Yeah. yeah. Stone Wrestling Guy on Twitter. It's a pretty uh, good question. Uh, what element of the craft, and I guess he's talking about wrestling, maybe promos, I don't know, but what element of the mm. craft do you believe you can improve upon? Ooh. Uh, I can improve upon every aspect. That's the beautiful thing about this business. You're never done learning. You're always learning. You're always trying to get better. And uh, look, there's nobody that, that's going to be be a, be a bigger critic of what I do than than I am on myself. Right. Um, I will watch a match and I will pick things apart to no end. So I'm always trying to improve on everything. There's nothing I can't improve on. That's the way I look at it. So probably the question that got asked the most uh where is paul smackage and are we going to see more of him at <laughs> AEW? well there you go that might be my secret tag team partner at some point 
There you the old, go. Good old Paul Smackage. Yeah. He's lurking somewhere. <laughs> I haven't heard that name in a little bit. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, we got a bunch of them in here. Uh, this is about uh, this is about Matt Hardy. Could we see a renewed rivalry between Christian Cage and Matt Hardy? I'd love to see them have a deletion match. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's in the cards somewhere. Um, right. You know, the, the beautiful thing is, is the equity that we both have um, in our rivalries from the past that we can really do that at any, at any point in time. And it can mean something, whether it's a month down the road or three years down the road, it really doesn't matter. It'll always be there. Antonio Denmark on Twitter. I'm actually very interested in this question. What is your favorite flavor of ice cream? <sighs> Man, um, I like a good mint chocolate chip. Oh, we are best friends. You have the right Cheez-Its. You have the right ice cream. Yeah. Dude. Dude, yeah. my boy, what's up? Yeah. Yeah. Antonio, if you have a chance to ask Christian <laughs> Cage a question, you come up with that shit. <laughs> well, we're going to top it. <laughs> Tony's just not a mint chocolate chip guy. Like, fuck him. <laughs> we're going to yeah. top Antonio's shitty question with one from Sign Guy. Okay. <laughs> Another shitty question. <laughs> <laughs> How do you like catering at AEW? <laughs> Um, it's good. I would, I would say, um, I haven't had a lot of it to be honest with you. Right. Because, uh, I kind of, uh, have my own prepared meals and that, but from what I right. have had, it's, uh, it's very good. Yeah. They do a pretty good job. They really do. And catering has, as we all know, catering has changed a great deal during the pandemic. Yes, of course. Yeah. So it's, it's not like before where you can go out and it's a, it's a big spread and it's laid out for you and you can right. pick what you want. Right. There's, it's limited choices and it's kind of boxed and you're just kind of, here's one, of one, of, one, one of four things here, you know, pick, right. pick, pick what you want. Right. So secret trick, you could ask for multiples of the same thing. They'll just oh, give you, wow. like, if you want like four of the potatoes, they'll just give you four potatoes. Like wow, you want to ask whatever you want. Yeah. They don't tell you that, but you can totally do it. Cause some dudes walk in there and they just ask for like 12 of the steak or whatever. I don't know if you're Brian Cage or something, but yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. No one wants 12 of the green beans. So there yeah. we go. <laughs> yeah. What would you think about having an unsanctioned barbed wire match in a fight pit? <laughs> what, what I think that's from Texas. Yeah. Texas rubble 95 on Twitter. I think he wants, I would, uh, yeah, he I wants think, to get booked. I think I would re I think I would re retire. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> we announced it. You're just like, hi, I'm done. Yeah, bye. Yeah, bye. <laughs> it's been real. I'm out. Yeah. I think Texas rebel 95 wants to get booked. I think that's what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, they all want to get booked until the bell rings. Right. And then they go, what the hell? Yeah. Oh, yeah. this actually hurts. Yeah. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. What? Well, Christian Cage, uh, it's I, I'm not one of the young kids, as you know, but man, yeah. I was stoked as well to hear that you were coming aboard with us, and it's it's been great. And I know you're going to lend a hand in a lot of things. I mean, your 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 motto, outwork everyone. Um, it just it resonates. It resonates with everybody in the business. I think, regardless of what your job is, right? A referee, announcer, a PR person. Uh, media guy, uh, you know, that's what you should do. That's what you should do. And I, and w w when I heard, you know, that's, you know, that's your, your catchphrase. Uh, I, I think about my mom who told me, she said, work harder than anyone because most people don't. Mm -hmm. and she told me that a long time ago. So I've always used that. I've always tried to outwork people. So yeah, uh, I, don't, I, I don't think it's just um, strictly for the wrestling business related either. That's every, right. every, occupation or anything that you want to do in your life, in your life, right. regardless of whether it's wrestling or, or, or not, it's, uh, that, that should be kind of everybody's motto. They want, want to put that work in and just be the best they can at whatever it is that they're doing. So, but as far as, um, you know, Tony, it's a thrill for me as well. And I think I told you this when you were on, on our podcast a couple of years ago that, uh, it's a thrill for me as well. I mean, I grew up on your voice and to Thank be you. able to, to be, you know, in the same company and uh, share space with you and, and be colleagues. It's uh, it's, it's pretty exciting for me as well. Yeah, it's a uh, to me. It's just uh, been a wonderful way to. This is my last great ride, and I, I'm so thankful to have been able to connect with you and Paul and and the the veterans that Tony have brought in to help out and and just uh, really really put a a real sparkle and shine on AEW. And and, mm -hmm. and uh, thanks for being with us here on our podcast, buddy. I appreciate absolutely. it. Thank you so much, Thank for you me. So much. Uh, this you was can absolutely follow, wonderful. You can follow Christian Cage on Twitter at Christian Four Peeps. That's the number four peeps. Uh, as well as on Instagram at Christian4Peeps as well. 
And you can follow and listen to AEW Unrestricted for free wherever you get your podcasts on all of your favorite apps, new episodes every Thursday morning. You can also watch us, our beautiful faces, on YouTube. New episodes on Mondays. Just search for AEW Unrestricted. Absolutely. And don't forget Dynamite on Wednesdays, 8 o'clock, 7 central on TNT. We're there every Wednesday night. Unless the NBA playoffs, then we may have to juggle around, but we'll be around every week. It's worth finding out when we're on because our show is always awesome because we got yeah. awesome people and an awesome culture. And yeah, pretty much everything about this place is awesome. So definitely tune in. I'm Aubrey Edwards. I'm Tony Schiavone. Thank you, Christian Cage. Thanks, thanks guys. Buddy. I really appreciate you having me. Thanks so much. Okay. And thanks for being with us on AEW Unrestricted. Yeah.